On Yanaseo, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, three American romance novelists discussing all things K-romance from a writer's lens. We fangirl over our favorite actors and actresses, talk up our trope addictions, and nerd out on K-drama deep dives. We'll throw in a few K-pop and K-skincare wrecks for good measure, because why not ride the Hollywood wave all the way to shore? So grab some deck bookie and listen to your new favorite unis. Hey, everybody. Hi there. Hi. So I've been thinking about pets more than I normally do, probably because, you know, this has been coming up on like the podcast with like imaginary cat. And now I feel like I'm like highly attuned to like cat memes and different things. And then my husband, because I'm in Michigan still, um, and he's back in California, he really only communicates to me primarily in text through pictures of himself with our dog or his dog, I should say. And so it's just you know, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me, like I'm feeling a little bit like I'm defective and like my petness and like my lack of having pets or I don't know, like, I guess I just don't really love pets as much as other people. And so um, something that's come up has been (sighs) my sister really wants to get my nephew an axolotl. And so her little, my nephew wants a hermit crab and she's like a no on this. And so the other day she texted me and was like, look, I'm calling you in 60 seconds and you need to pretend like you're a local pet shop and you're going to tell (laughs) Malcolm that they are all out of hermit crabs and axolotl or nothing. And I was like, okay, okay, I can do this. So the phone rings and I like, (laughs) I thought I was better than this. Like, I'm like, hello, Washington state pet shop. And then I just lose my shit. And I start like, be like, like wheezing, like I do on the podcast. And she's like, oh, we are inquiring if there are any hermit crabs available. And I was like, oh, you must be the fifth person to call me today about hermit crabs. Oh and there is God. a global shortage of hermit crabs. And I just start losing it. Like, I'm just cackling. And I'm like, yes, reproduction rates have plummeted. And I just like, I'm I'm wheezing. And so I'm like, but I do have to let you know that we do have axolotl and we do consider them an ideal replacement for hermit crabs. And so we go through this whole thing. We get off the phone. I like was losing my shit being like, oh my God, I totally like blew that for, you know, my nephew's four, but like, come on. I was like dying and apparently sold it, sold it well to him. So he was convinced and disappointed, but like kind of resigned. But the best part is my brother-in-law works for Microsoft not a dumb guy, like a PhD in astrophysics. I guess when my sister hung up, he's like, oh, that's crazy about the hermit crabs. And I was like, what? (laughs) Like he was overhearing the conversation and thought that I was truly the pet shop. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, yes. Now I've been thinking like, maybe I would like an axolotl, but I did tell this to Amy earlier today. Like I, my fear is that they are so freaking cute and slightly humanoid looking. Like I kind of can't deal if one dies because like, I can't deal with like a fucking, sorry, but like a dead axolotl. Is there, is the, is your sister's reason, reason for wanting the axolotl instead of the hermit crab because it would just stay in the tank and you can't like take out like a hermit crab. You could take it out and like let it crawl out of its shell and stuff like that. She had some like research done on hermit crab and look, Look, I'm not going to speak to, I don't know fully where she stands on pets. I think she's kind of in my game of like, I mean, I've been known to call pet stores and be like, what's the pet that's going to die the fastest? Oh, it's a rat. I guess we're getting rats now. (laughs) And so, yeah, where I was like, what's going to, what just isn't going to live very long and we'll invest in that. Um, (laughs) I'm a horrible human. I, I, I am. But um. I guess she did some research in hermit crabs. She said like, they're very hard to get the humidity of the tank. Correct. So often they like end up slowly suffocating over time. And she didn't want to be like torturing little crabs thinking like, you know, cause they're not going to be able to be like, Hey, the humidity sucks for me. So. Okay. Well, that's a very, that's a very ethical decision that she made. Yeah. The, actually, kind of like, the whole hermit crab trade is like bad news ethically it's terrible do not get a hermit crab i'm sorry listeners <laughs> it's honestly if you do any uh, if you do any sort of googling on hermit crabs you will see it's terrible do not get a hermit crab at the beach tell your kid no that it's just it's terrible yeah and that's what she was saying she was saying ethically there's apparently like lots of complications with it for those of you with younger children i'm gonna put on my librarian hat here um there is a nonfiction picture book called cute as an axolotl 
And it's a book of all animals like like axolotls that are like just weirdly super cute. But like weird looking too. You know what I mean? Like yeah, plugging it just for for those of you younger kids. We yeah. own that we own that book. Yeah. Yeah, we own that book. It's adorable. Like I, my kids love it or they did when they were a little bit younger. So apparently there's an axolotl in Minecraft. Or maybe it's Yeah, I I have to ask my son or maybe it's in that um that pet adopt part of or maybe it's in the Robux part. Maybe it's it's either Minecraft or Robux. So actually, I'm not sure. I just know there's an it's in one of it's in one of those two games. I forget. But um there's an axolotl so my kids have been talking about axolotls recently and I personally love them but they are so i I shouldn't say but but like they they're very they're intelligent so uh, like i've known axolotls like they get to know you like these are yeah these are not get one leah would get one that would like love her and she would have zero feel she would have zero feelings for it (laughs) i think i might actually really i feel like i would get really attached to an axolotl because i like babies and it looks like a baby I feel like it's just, not, it's not a beginner fish. That's what I'm like, you know what I mean? I would get like a fish tank first. It has like tetras in it. Now I'm going into like my pet store mode, but I'm just saying it's not a beginner fish. Okay. Well, let me segue us before we turn into like a whole other pet episode that I let us down into saying if an axolotl died, I would cry. And today what our show is about is male tears, primarily being pretty when you cry in K-drama. In Denmark, there's Huga, a quality of coziness and comfortable conviviality that engenders a feeling of contentment or well-being, regarded as a defining characteristic of Danish culture. In Japan, there's Yukioe, the floating world or living detached from the bothers of life. There is a word in Irish that has no English equivalent, edwantus, that feeling of unease or anxiety caused by being somewhere new or by being surrounded by people you don't know. In Yiddish, there's kvel, to experience pride in someone else, typically one's children. These are all examples of words that are not easily translated, yet represent specific vibes and feelings. And in Korea, there is Han. There is no simple English equivalent for Han, yet it's a sentiment that we outsiders to K-drama can often pick up on. However, as it's uniquely Korean and we aren't remotely Korean, we don't want to white-splain this, so let's hear from someone who can speak to the topic with more nuance and authority. Regina Kim, a freelance writer based in Queens, runs a very good blog, www.reginakim.com, and has this to say on the topic of Han. Quote, they say that suffering is part of the human condition, and Koreans understand this all too well. Many of them have been able to channel this Han, all the suppressed rage, sadness, and other emotions it entails, to create beautiful masterpieces of art, film, music, and literature that are imbued with soul and give a raw window into the human experience. Koreans are often said to be the most emotional of all the Asians, and personally, as someone of Korean descent, again, I'm reading Regina Kim's words, I've come to embrace this stereotype. To be emotional, it is to know what it's like to be human, and I believe this is why so many Korean artists have been able to create powerful works that resonate with global audiences. From films like Old Boy and Parasite to traditional and contemporary Korean music that have drawn fans from all over the world. Being emotional is also a sign that you care deeply, and it's partly why Koreans are quick to rally together in times of crisis, whether it's the 1997 Asian financial crisis or the more recent COVID-19 pandemic. Understanding this concept of Han can add a whole new layer of meaning while observing Korean culture, from fills to K-dramas to music and art. So, well, obviously, the idea of Han is very nuanced and powerful, and we're hopefully going to be doing like a fun and slightly silly podcast. We did want to take a moment to acknowledge that there's often a lot happening on a cultural level that we're missing as outsiders when we're, you know, consuming um, Korean media. But, you know, that being said, we are also human beings with eyes and an appreciation for the finer men things in life. And many Korean drama actors, frankly, look damn pretty when they cry. So that's what we're talking about today, and let's get to it. A brief note, this show might contain spoilers to some dramas, but we're going to signal anything that might be an overt spoiler, so you can skip ahead if you want to protect your virgin ears. Megan, first up. Overall thoughts on the amount of male tears in K-drama. Do you feel like you are A, over it, B, pretty satisfied on the tear ratio, or B, C, 
more dehydrate yourselves and cause mass flooding through the Korean peninsula. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I would say I'm pretty satisfied. Um, I think K-drama does it right with just the perfect amount of tier ratio. So Tempted or The Great Seducer is a drama where the hero, played by my absolute favorite, Wu Do Wan, who was let down a little bit by this drama, cried for like 75% of it, for real. And <laughs> <laughs> by the end, it was it was too much. Like, I felt bad. I was like, let this guy have a word of dialogue without crying. Please, God. So <laughs> I do have, like, a limit on my cry tolerance, but I would say m almost, I would, other than that drama, to be honest, that was the only drama that it was just too much. And it was too much crying for, like, it's not just because he was a man. It, was it would have been too much crying for anyone. So, Leah, how do you feel about men crying in real life versus K-drama life? Okay, so I didn't grow up surrounded by a lot of male tears. Um, I was raised in the rural Midwest, Michigan, as I've been bitching about my internet connectivity for the past month. And, you know, I don't think I had many male relatives who were invited to um, share vulnerable emotions openly. My dad is a lot more empathetic than most of my uncles. And I can only remember him crying once in my childhood and that was during um, a very traumatic funeral. I'm also on the tail end of Gen X, and I don't feel like sensitive male emotions were something that was really like widespread encouraged when I was younger either. I feel like angst was celebrated, but also like lots of cynicism, and that came with a lot less tears and vulnerability. So this is my little memory trail that I thought about while I did this. But, you know, I got to college, and that's when I fell in love for the first time. And, you know, I fell and went down hard. My first boyfriend was 18, too, and was basically just a super dumb boy who didn't always treat me right. And, you know, I was too young and dumb to realize I should expect better. After a year, um, I wised up a bit. I broke up with him. And I remember that's when the waterworks started. So a lot like Wu Dao Wan in, um, you know, Tempted, he really just let the floodgates go. And it was my first time encountering a lot of male tears. And this is like kind of like Noah Ark flood levels. <laughs> I wasn't really kind about it. I think it shook me up at first because I was really unfamiliar with this. Um, but it turned into like more of like a crocodile tear, like regular th thing. Sorry, I feel kind of bad. I was like, I hope he doesn't ever find this podcast. But like I can remember him crying in a doorway at my house and my roommate reaching over and grabbing the remote to turn the volume up because it was such a regular occurrence <laughs> that we all just kind of got over it. He would just come to my house and cry. <laughs> but OK, I hit my 40s and I'm a wife and a mother to a son. And I like to think I've a, I've matured emotionally from like being 18. And at this point, you know, if my husband husband cries, I make space for it. And I don't think it's a regular occurrence. But if it does happen, I know it means he's going through a lot. And it's a sign for me to kind of stop everything and be supportive. And that's the same with my son. Um, and I want us to have healthy emotional expressions at home. And I often watch K-drama with my daughter. And I think the fact that men often cry during times of vulnerability in these shows is really good for her to see because I want her to expect more from people in her life and think an exchange of honest emotions is healthy. So I thank K-drama for normalizing this more, um, even if it's coming from a place of fiction rather than South Korean societal norms. Yeah, I saw a tweet that was like, your favorite, you know, hero in your K-drama is sweet because he was paid to be, and it made, it made me laugh. <laughs> I was like mid-drink and I choked laughing because it was just very funny. Amy, why don't you think we see male actors emoting as much in American or, you know, just Western media? So I think what we mentioned earlier about the about Korean Han and the bloggers owning up to the stereotype of Koreans being an emotional people, you know, making that part of what makes it so widely acceptable, maybe in dramas for people to be emotional. And hopefully in real life, because she's talking real life. So I know, you know, we're joking about, you know, our favorite Korean heroes get paid to be that vulnerable. But still, I'm hoping that there is some truth to that, that it's acceptable that people cry. And in this case, that men cry, right? Our first drama for all three of us was Crash Landing on You. And aside from the fabulous storytelling and romance truly done right, one thing that has stood out to me in that drama since I watched it twice, and I remember even texting Leah about it because you're the one who got me, Leah was the one who got me into it, is that Hyunbin's character, Ri Jong-huk, was a big-time alpha who at times cried his eyes out. 
And not once did Captain Ree showing his emotions seem or feel emasculating. And all of the other men in the drama cried too. It wasn't just him, but it was just his character being such an alpha and then showing us such vulnerability was really, really impressive to me. I know I've seen male leads cry in Western media, but the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about it is like Leo DiCaprio's melodramatic dropping to his knees cry in Romeo and Juliet, which is now one of the biggest crying memes that you can find. Same with James Vanderbeek as Dawson from Dawson's Creek. And oh, these yeah. images of men being over the top emotional have turned comic in our culture. So I decided to dig for a little bit more because those are the only ones that I could think of off the top of my head. I decided to dig for more to further prove my point that while men do cry in Western media, it is few and far between compared to K-drama. And it's often turned into something comedic rather than something that celebrates men being vulnerable. So here's what I found when I googled, quote, Hollywood movies where men cry. The first hit was 20 movies that make grown men cry. The second was 50 films that make men cry. Another one was 15 movies that men are allowed to cry at. So, and I was looking, you know, and my search was for characters crying in movies and instead this is what i got so oh my God. don't even get me started first of all on the sentence structure of that last one <laughs> <laughs> with the preposition at the end because that's bad but do you guys see a theme here mm. all of these article titles insinuate that only under certain circumstances is it okay for men to cry in american culture even if we're not talking full-on toxic masculinity, which does still exist, it's ingrained in our culture that women are allowed to cry and men aren't, and this sort of cultural norm permeates our media. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there are problematic cultural norms in most, if not all, cultures, but what K-drama does right is making it the norm that men emote just as much as women do, and Western culture could certainly take a page from that. Here, here. Thank you. I love that. Thanks for doing that Googling. That is very telling. It was very telling and super, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but, but I was, you know what I mean? Like I was, mm -hmm. I was thinking that I was going to find like a YouTube reel of like male characters crying and that people would have like made fun of it. Right. But instead I found all of this stuff about when are men allowed to cry, which is basically never, but like, here's a list of movies where we'll say it's okay. Yeah. So my husband does not cry very much. He's just not an emotional person, but I've obviously I've seen him cry. He cries only at real life stuff. So he cry he's cried at funerals and like the birth of our children. That's like seriously, he just doesn't cry. And I mean, we have watched some I I still remember we watched um Big Hero 6, okay? And whoever has watched Big Hero 6 knows that that is oh my god, no one warned me that you cry. So I mean, I am the whole all four of us are watching so my husband and i and my two kids and i am sobbing so hard i can't breathe my kids turn around see that i think they weren't they were a little younger i don't think they fully understood what was happening at that moment and they turned around saw me crying then they both started crying and I, we we all like look at neil and he's just like stone faced like he has no i think he just doesn't cry at fake at, at fake things like i don't think he feels he doesn't feel movies entertainment he doesn't feel it like that my, I say my 12 year old son is the same way. Like I, I, he's 12 and I can't remember the last time he cried when it wasn't from like the last time I remember him crying, I think was when he got like a friend accidentally hit him in the face with a Frisbee and he needed stitches. Like that's the last time I can remember him crying. And that was like three <laughs> years ago. Like he, I like, I'll say to him, like when I can tell he's upset about something, I'm like, you know, it's okay to cry. And he's like, I don't need to cry. My daughter and I are big criers in media and we, are also, I think we've talked about it on here before, we're big Marvel fans. And when we went to go see, the three of us, my my son and my daughter and I, saw Endgame in the theater opening day, because that's what, that's what real fans do. And we saw it three times in opening week, too, in the theater. And I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but there's some stuff in that movie that makes you cry. And my son always sits in the middle because he is the keeper of the barrel of popcorn. <laughs> Like literally like tells us what, like we can, <laughs> we can each have like a little handful for, during a trailer and then we have to wait till the next trailer. Then it gets to, like, he rations, he rations the freaking popcorn. But anyway, so he sits in the middle. And so my daughter, you know, my daughter and I are on the outsides. And I remember when the first really like cry part happened 
And I looked over at my daughter and she's sobbing and I'm sobbing. And my son looks back and forth to both of us. And he's like, what is the matter with you? Cause he doesn't, he doesn't feel it. Like he's not, I don't think that he's like a psychopath or anything like that. Like I have seen him emote before, but he doesn't fake things. Don't move him either. So I don't like, what is that? I don't know. Like I, I like sometimes I'm like, it'd be nice to have that like gene, but then like, I, I like, I like crying at things. Like I, yeah, I like feeling my shows really deeply. It's cathartic. It's cathartic. It's just interesting to me that there are people who can separate that, you know? Yeah, I've never seen Nick cry in a film. And I, I, that's a good point. Yeah, no, I've never seen media make him cry. <laughs> All right, so bringing it back to K-drama, what's a drama that's made you cry the hardest? For me, uh, there's a difference between most and hardest. Uh, you know, there's the dramas that have made me cry a lot. Like I've kind of like whimpered like on and off for like three episodes. <laughs> But then there are drama, like a Camellia kind of made me just whimper for like three episodes. And then there's the hardest where I am like, I'm sobbing so hard, I, I can't breathe. Um, And that's probably a toss up between Chloe, Flower of Evil, and It's Okay Not to Be Okay. Or I'm sorry, the yeah, the most that I cried. But I would say the hardest is still i am not a robot i don't, i mean i know it's crazy i because there are there are so many others that are i think pack so much emotional punch but first there was something about that storyline that just resonated so much with me um i mean i cried so hard that my entire face was swollen like i couldn't see i couldn't see <laughs> at, at one point the tears were just coming like i didn't even like I, I was kind of like not even sobbing anymore but my eyes were still leaking and I like verbally cried out to an empty room. Like I was like, this is so painful. Like, it's like my cat who's just like, what the fuck? Um, and I mean, it was just, it was, it was very, it was very hard. And like I said, it was, it was the hardest cry. Um, like I said, other, other dramas made me cry a lot. And it, and I would say flower of evil. I got pretty close to crying pretty hard, but yeah. But for the, for those of you who have seen, I am not a robot. I'll just say it was the reset scene and you'll know what I mean. Uh, but that was so hard. I like so my, my that was my husband came up to check on me. He heard me like whimpering <laughs> because he, he was he was concerned. He thought like someone had died. He like thought I was on the phone with someone. And I'm like, no, it's just this drama. And he's like, oh my god, I can't even see your eyes. I'm like, so bad. I like your differentiation between most and hardest. I think that's a, a really good one. And so I, I agree with a couple of the ones that you're bringing up here. I didn't cry that hard in. I'm not a robot because I know it was just me. I know. And that's okay. And that's okay. And I mean, that's a very powerful scene that you're talking about, but it's also like, I, I just, cause you know, I mean, it's the rule of romance, right? It's a rule of romance. I knew it was going to be a happily ever after. And I wasn't too worried. I mean, it was, gr there was great conflict in that one, but yeah, I just, I was pretty yeah. confident it would be okay. <laughs> but I, I think, um, I think Crash Landing on You and Flower of Evil, I cried the most often. Um, Flower of Evil, I was not expecting to cry. And I'm not going to give any spoilers as far as, you know, when I cried in Flower of Evil, we talked about it a little bit in the Flower of Evil podcast, but it was once the floodgates opened in that movie, then I cried every time, like, there was emotion going on in that movie. <laughs> and I don't even want to say, like, who was emoting, because I don't want to give stuff away, but, like, you guys know who I'm talking about. Yeah. But I think Goblin Still Stands is the drama that made me cry both the most and the hardest. With Uncontrollably Fond, probably a close second for hardest. Uncontrollably Fond is that wonderful one that I took one for the team with Kim Woo Bin and Bae Suzy, where in episode one, you find out that Kim Woo Bin's character, and he is a K-drama actor in this drama, and you find out that he has a brain tumor and he only has a few months left to live. And uh, it was rough. And when shit got tragic in that drama, I cried until near dehydration. Like it was, it was, it was, I was a mess. And I was like bereft for like days after that drama ended. And I'll never watch that drama again. But Goblin, yeah, Goblin was the first one I think that made me like just a complete and utter mess for multiple episodes. Yeah, I think Goblin was my first ugly cry. I definitely cried in Crash Landing, um, which was new for me because I mean, I cry in movies and shows, but like, I wouldn't say that like, it's a norm for me until K-drama. <laughs> and so like 
Chloe surprised me at like my level of emoting goblin. I mean, I was kind of just like beginning to lose it in goblin, but I think I cried the hardest in probably it's a toss up for me between Mr. Sunshine and when the camellia blooms, I probably cried the most in Mr. Sunshine. I believe I spent like the last five episodes, probably just like tears coming like <laughs> making like what you said like i think tears were just coming out of me like leaking out of my body for like five episodes straight um without ceasing and when the camellia blooms i i don't know what it was about that it got me in the emotions though especially when it had to do with kind of like some of the issues around like motherhood and like mothering and like what we give up for our children and i remember nick walking in when i was watching camellia and i was on our bed just howling and I started laughing because I was like, look, I know I look ridiculous, but you just need to let this happen. Like he was like going to use the bathroom or something. And I was just like, bah! like on the bed. And I think we've talked about this too, in terms of like COVID and the pandemic and like disassociation. And so I think that there probably is a lot to be said for like, you know, being able to have cathartic tears happening during 2020 <laughs> and then into 2021. Okay, so now is the time in our drama where we get to one of our favorite segments, which is our K recommendation of the week. And today we have Leah with K Skin. Okay, so I am going to be talking today about tomato jelly lip tint from Skin Food, which you can get on Soco Glam for a pretty reasonable price. It's like nine bucks, but it's this lip tint that, okay, I know that like we're talking about how pretty K drama heroes are when they cry, but another thing that always gets me is like, people have amazingly good lips in (laughs) K-drama. Like, I don't know what they're doing with their mouths, but their mouths are looking good all the time. So hydrated. So hydrated. And like the color on the women is always like on point. And I mean, look, I understand there's like a litany of makeup artists. And honestly, let's give them the credit for this. I mean, what they are like, their art is at a peak game, you know, so I get lip envy and something that I have purchased um, from the Soko Glam website that I really like is this, um, tomato jelly tint lip because I don't know like yeah it gives you like the bomb hydration but I also feel like it kind of like actually more than like smothering your lips with like another color it kind of like somehow magically like enhances like the natural color of your lips so there is a subtle tint to it but I think it actually somehow just like pops like your normal lip color so like if you're looking for like a little pop I mean, look, I know we're back to wearing masks all the time and that shit sucks. But like, (laughs) if you ever want to like treat yourself and be home and like make your mouth look good, I recommend it. I just looked it up. I want it. I want it because I I buy lip stuff all the time and I all I really want is a tint. What color do you have? Um, I went with cherry tomato. I like berry tomato too. I'm getting I'm getting like two. They're only nine dollars. Yeah, I like that. I'm ordering it right now. Yeah, I mean, they're afford- like they're pretty affordable for nine bucks. They last a pretty long time. Um, and I kind of feel like I'd have to look it up again, but I feel like there might be some SPF in it, but I might be lying to you. If there's not, remember to always put SPF on your lips too so you don't get like nasty discoloration. That sunscreen needs to go everywhere. And then also just, um, you know, since we're off on this detour, I do want to remind folks, um, you know, if you like to see Rex and you'd like to hear more about like the things that we're into and also general hijinks, we do have um, an Instagram account we would love you all to subscribe to. Um, That's Afternoon of Delight podcast on Instagram. And we also have a, a little store on Redbubble that you can find under afternoon a pod where we have lots of like inside jokes from the show where you can like get uh, my other pillow is Kim Soo Hyun's lips or, you know, have our fun logo that you can put on a tote or a sweatshirt. So definitely um, also check out our Redbubble store, which is after Nuna pod. And please definitely follow our Instagram at afternoon, delight podcast. And while you're at it doing all these awesome things, the thing that would help us more than anything else is to swing by wherever you listen. Let's say it's the Apple podcast store and leave us a five star review because it really does help with discoverability. And we love to be able to find new people to welcome into our K-drama fam. So continuing about crying, uh, Leah and Amy, you do have a crying scene in a K-drama that didn't hit the mark for you. So would you like to discuss what happened with Kim Bum in Boys Over Flowers? Can I reenact it? (laughs) (laughs) 
How about if I intro it and then Leah, you can you can give us the down and dirty because you always do and it's amazing. We'll never be over this, right? Like as much as we loved Baby Kim Bum and Boys Over Flowers, the scene where his would-be girlfriend, Gaol, takes him to a rooftop to show him the message of love that he missed when he blew off his first love years ago. It's like as cringy as it gets. And this is a scene where Lee Jong, that's Kim Bum's character, should have been grateful to Gaol, the girl who loves him now, because she worked tirelessly to give him this message that he missed from his first love. But instead of thanking her, Leah, <laughs> what happens? Okay. So this is a moment that I feel bad because I think Kim Baum, look, if you are listening out there at any time, like we love you. We love you in this drama. We really, you were like a highlight of Boys Over Flowers for us. And look, Tail the Nine-Tailed, scene stealer. So, you know, law school, you look great in that. We think you're great. We really don't want to dog you. But in this case, like, son, you really <laughs> just like, I don't even know. <laughs> so essentially, we are at the top of the roof. This is an emotional scene. And I just need to preface it by saying I've seen Meteor Garden. And this scene is reenacted in Meteor Garden as well, because that's like a spinoff of Boys Over Flowers. And it's a very powerful, emotional, sexy, sweet, romantic scene. So I was like pumped. I loved it in Meteor Garden. Yes. So I was pumped. I was like, we're on the roof. We're going to have the roof. <laughs> so I think that made it doubly worse. So, okay, first, like, Kim Bum has, like, the mullet, <laughs> right? Because that's just, like, the style of Boys Over Flowers. Like, they all have, like, these terrible wolf boy mullets. And he collapses to his knees, lifts his arms to the sky, like, uh, and then just begins to go, do over! <laughs> Which is do over. <laughs> because... He's yelling do over? <laughs> <laughs> Like he wants to go back. He wants to go back in time and like go right. and see this message of love that his with, then the, girl, with the other girl. So now he's, he's with like, like Nube, who's super beautiful, who's like done this hugely <laughs> romantic thing, and he's like, do over. And there's like no romance between them. He's just a... <laughs> And it is it's the Leo, it's the Leo DiCaprio Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, it's meme. just like, you know <laughs> what, what Dawson looked hotter in his crying memes. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> and you just kind of want to like slap him because you're like, dude, this girl just like worked hard for this romantic moment. You just fucked it up. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, never over it. Never ever over it. So and I'll try to find it so we can put it on social media. If I can find a clip, I mean you really have to experience it if you haven't watched I'm it. I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up on YouTube. You should. So okay, Megan, would you rather be condemned to a life of watching dramas that never make you cry or ones that make you ugly cry? Why? So as much as I good love a good ugly cry, I can't I just can't do it all the time. It drains me so emotionally. Um so if I had to pick, I'd choose to never cry. I know. Oof. Wow. I know. I know, but I just cannot. I could never just only watch dramas that made me ugly cry. Oh my god. I would be a I would be a basket case. Yeah, I would go with cry too. We're judging you silently. Oh man. <laughs> okay. So what is a crying scene from a K drama? Like where someone is crying, like probably the sexy ass hero, but what's a crying scene that lives in your mind rent free? So I'm going to try to talk about this without spoilers, uh, but heads up that I'm going to talk about Lawless Lawyer, which we will be doing a deep dive on um, probably closer to the fall. Um, and Leah hasn't seen it yet. but So I'm trying to be vague, but um, even if the plot point I'm talking about wouldn't spoil the overall drama anyway. In Lawless Lawyer, Bong Sang-pil, played by our very favorite Lee Jun gi watched his mother die at a very young age. That's not a spoiler. You know, you learn that right away. And so he basically lived his whole life for like the next 20 years or so um, in order to get revenge for her. So he has one last person who basically means the, the, the world to him. You know, he's got like one last... One last person on uh, Team uh, Sang Pil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's got one last person on Team Bong Sang Pil. And of course, his enemy uses this person against Bong Sang Pil because that's what happens. You know, they always use the ones closest to you. So the scene that I think about all the time is when Lee Jun Gi is desperately trying to save this loved one. And he knows it's not going to work. Like he knows that this, there's no saving. You know, he knows it and the person knows it. 
and you know, the other person is kind of like, you just got to let me go. And he doesn't want to do it. He holds on anyway. And he's sobbing his heart out this. And, and if you've seen lawless lawyer, uh, Bong Sang pill is a very cocky, arrogant, confident character. And he rarely kind of lets any sort of emotion get to him. Like he, he just doesn't show vulnerability very often. So he's just, Oh my God, he is sobbing so hard he's screaming he's crying there's tears streaming down my down his face and you know i liked i i love this drama up to this point but when this happened i was like oh my god i didn't know he had this in him it was my first lee jun gi role and it was amazing like i loved it so much angst so much heart heartbreak and it's just a really really powerful scene and i think about it whenever someone mentions what's you know about a crying scene i don't know it's just the first scene that always comes to my mind it was a super, super yeah. powerful scene. Like, and I, that was it a was, rough episode to watch. But such a good drama. And I'm so excited mm-hmm. that we're going to deep dive it. But truly for me there, as far as like what lives rent free in my mind, I because I love the super emotional scenes. So I think I've got kind of several. And one is in episode 11 of Flower of Evil that we talked about in our Flower of Evil podcast. Another great Lee jung moment. But I'm gonna not going to talk about it because that would spoil the entire drama. So... I'm going to talk about a different scene. Um, So just go listen to our Flower of Evil podcast, and then you'll know what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to Goblin, and it's a toss-up between three scenes that I'll try to mention without major spoilers, because these three scenes will will forever um, live rent-free in my mind. So the rooftop scene after the big showdown between Kim Shin and Park Jung-hung, when Intak loses her shit. The scene in Quebec where adult Untak has a revelation and loses her shit. (laughs) And the tea shop scene where Kim Shin loses his shit. Sad <laughs> love, oh y'all. God, sad, sad scene, love. So, obviously, echoing all of this, Amy, I feel the same way um, as you about Goblin. But I wanted to c- talk about a crying scene that got to me recently, and I need to do it in a way that doesn't have spoilers. So, you know, I'm going to do my best. Um, I finished uh, Reply 1994 last weekend, and this is a drama that gets, in my opinion, a lot of undeserved hate. Like, look, this is definitely not a perfectly executed story, but I kind of feel like it fails forward. And by that, I mean, even if it has parts that don't work overall, you know, I'm happy I watched it. And I'm going to think about these characters for much longer than I have um, characters in other dramas and even other dramas that like probably held together better plot wise. Um, okay. So my caveat is you all know, I love a painful love triangle, a love square, a love pentagram. Um, and when one is done really well with deserving winners across the board, like I really don't like like one where you're like, oh, one sucks and like one's awesome. Obviously that's going to be like the dude. I like those ones where you kind of don't know. That's my jam. And in this drama, there's a lot of teasing over the final lead, um, you know, true pairing. And when the loser in the triangle finally just has to accept, like, it's not going to happen for them. It felt like it went down in a way that was so raw and so realistic to that new adult age. Um, It was so painful. And I felt like it kind of acknowledged that fact that sometimes, look, Even though it sucks, you have to just take a minute, sit down and feel all the emotions in order to have that cathartic release and move forward. Um, So, yeah, it's a crying scene that really got me. It took me by surprise. I was blubbering and I loved it. So what emotion tends to make you cry the most? Um, Fear of losing something. I cry the hardest when a character is losing something and is desperately trying to hold on to it or the memories. So it could be, you know, when a loved one is dying or breaking up with them, it could be, it could be something not tangible that they're losing. It's always just the the loss that gets me. Yeah, I totally agree. Like that desperation, I think is really what gets me. And that is, you know, talking about the three scenes from Goblin that stuck out to me. That's why I think like in that rooftop scene, when Untak loses her shit, like that desperation of trying not to lose a person, not to lose her memories of this person. Like it was just bananas. Like I was a mess. And I think maybe that's why I didn't have the same reaction that you did to the reset scene in I'm not a robot is because 
again, like it was a really rough, heavy emotional scene for me, but I didn't feel like all was lost kind of thing. Like I was like, this is going to pull itself together right. at some point. And I, and I think maybe that's, you know, where in Goblin, like the paranormal, you know, fantasy bit of it comes in, like anything can happen there. So you don't know at that point, like it was, I think in Goblin, that was like episode, like it was, we still had like four episodes left to the end, I think something like that. So I was like, what the hell is going to happen now? You know, kind yeah. of thing. So I think for me with, I'm not a robot. It was that he, it was that I felt his emotion. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yes. So I felt like, even though I kind of knew, I was like, I, I, you know, my tears were like, I, I, I don't know, man. Kim McHugh is just everything. It was, it was, um, yeah. It was an empathic. It, it was an it was, empathic. It was an moment. absolutely empathic cry for Kim Minkyu. Absolutely. And I'm not. And I'm. I'm, I'm no, not no, trying no, to no, I know. it at all. I'm just trying to explain the difference for me and why I think you know that sort of desperation in God. Oh, I totally got it. Because I, totally I did. I did cry in that scene in uh, I'm Not well, No, Black, the Untak but... scene was incredibly painful. Scribbling in that notebook was the end of me. Oh. That was the end of me. That's when, <laughs> that's what really got yep. me. And yeah, to like kind of basically riff on the same things you're saying, like I think for me, I what gets me is like a death. And I don't necessarily mean a death of a person, although certainly that's going to probably get me going. But it's like the death of an idea or even a dream. So kind of like what I was just talking about from like Reply 1994, like the moment that a character realizes like, you know, that like whatever idea or hope they had is like truly dead, even if it's for the best, like, oh, God, that gets me. Yeah, that's rough. That's a good that's a good uh analogy that you have there i like that so who is the prettiest crier make the case and this is going by role not actor all right megan i have a feeling of what you're gonna say so why don't you take um, it away <laughs> i know right i just uh so i'm gonna go with my my kim min q <laughs> my Yoo sung ho oh my god he's such a pretty crier even when he's angry and he's like railing at hit like betrayal and everything He's still just like beautiful. Like I just, oh my God. I just, I loved him so much. His emotional range is astounding and mm -hmm. also beautiful. Like he, mm -hmm. he could be that emotional with a cat too. Just saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So honestly, I think all of my K-drama heroes are beautiful when they cry, but Lee Dong Wook in Goblin kind of takes the cake for me. When Reaper sees Sunny for the first time on the bridge and they don't know each other, but he looks up at her and a tear just falls straight down his chiseled cheek. And he has no idea why. He just, just He's just stunned and beautiful. And I need to know if that was like a legit tear fall or eye drops because it was just too pretty. He is a very pretty crier. I did not think of him, and I should have, because even at like the really emotional scenes later when he cries harder, it's just, he's still just so he's pretty. He's a beautiful crier. And, you know, that is like, you know, if I could have like a Christmas gift this year, it would be to answer that question. Like, was that an eye drop or did he just literally just somehow like eke out one perfect chin, like little tear down his cheek? I think it's got to be fake, but I'm going to pretend like it's real. No. I know. I know. Because I just love his his expression, too. Like, he's just like. What is happening? Okay, so look, I actually really love Siwon crying. I think he's <laughs> just the cutest. Like, Run On was my first experience with him. And look, I liked him, but I didn't connect with him as much as I did once I got to, like, me saying. But, like, it doesn't matter. Like, I just love this little guy crying. He's, like, such a cute little pumpkin. I even, like, follow him on Instagram <laughs> now because he, like, runs. And I'm, like, totally, like, like it's no, like I don't have a crush on it. Like it's just like there's something I just love him, <laughs> and like I love watching him run his races and always like go you see one. And so when he like he cries, I just want to like wrap him up in cotton wool and like comfort him and like definitely without any kind of like lurid ajuming that I'm like known for. It's just like he's just a sweet little thing for me. So like what you're saying here about wrapping him up in cotton wool. What K drama character would you like to comfort and dry their damp eyes and why healer 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 forever forever <laughs> i love him he's my precious baby that's just just watch the drama if you want to know why that's all i gotta say i was gonna say the same thing because for me it's do hyun su episode 11 of flower of evil and i'm not telling you why <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch 
And I'm going to like put on my dirty like Nuna cap again and say like, okay, so I was very sweet with Siwon and now we're going to get to like young sick who I have less sweet feelings about <laughs> um, and more dirty, dirty feelings. But um, look in when the camellia blooms, um, you know, actor Kong Ha Newell, like he gets that little lip quivering in the police station and look, it's not meant to be hot and it's so hot. <laughs> I will totally like he is not a pretty crier in that drama, but I love his crying. You know what I mean? Like like what you're saying, like it's not hot when he gets the lip quiver, but it is. I know it's like messy and I just it want is. him to it's like It's messy and real. I think that's what's hot about it. Yeah, rip off that like ill-fitting tracksuit. I I mean, let's just that's a that's a podcast. That's a whole other episode. Rip off his giant t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Leah's dirty fantasy hour can be its own podcast sometime. <laughs> Okay, so what are we all watching? So I am almost caught up with Hospital Playlist Season 2. I'm on Episode 5, and Episode 6 just dropped today. So I should be caught up by the weekend. Um, Gosh, I love this show so much. Like, so, so much. But these episodes are so long. They're 90 minutes each. So it's taking me so long to catch up. But I just, I love it. So I'm not complaining. I'm really, really happy that you enjoyed it because i think it's one of those like you know would have been some of the other dramas where like if someone didn't love it like it would hurt on like a level like i feel like cost playlist like if you didn't like it i think it would like actually hurt me no it's making me think a dude in crocs is sexy (laughs) and i'm watching startup got a trope that i have not seen yet in k-drama and i often think that this is a trope that is done poorly and in this case i think it's done really damn well and really cleverly and that's the cyrano trope which means you know we do have a bit of a love triangle which is my jam and then obviously you know we have one person who is a worthy suitor who is like writing letters and communicating and emoting and another worthy character who kind of is like letting those words flow through them to the heroine and she has no idea about any of it and it's it's just yeah it's done in a really modern fresh way Ooh, fun i'm excited for that um so i have i'm kind of in the middle of zombie detective which i am enjoying it's just totally different and silly um and then i did start my roommate is a gumio which uh I'm going to talk more next episode. So I don't really want to say much about it now. I'll just say that I, because I've only watched the first episode, but I'll just say I'm really into it. So I wanted to give a book rec today. And it's uh, the topic that we were going with was what's a book that made you ugly cry. And um, for me, this is not a romance, but it is a love story. And it's One Day by David Nichols. Each chapter covers the lives of two British protagonists on the 15th of July, St. Swithin's Day, for 20 years. One Day is also a movie, which you may have seen, um, but it's not a very good one, honestly. Read the book. It's a billion times better, but make sure to stay hydrated because I'm pretty sure I was just a raisin making animal noises by the end of the book. (laughs) All right. So what are we talking about next week? We are going to be doing Love It or Leave It. So we are each going to be picking a K-drama that we have never seen, watching the first episode, and then talking about, like, did it hook us? Did it not hook us? And also just kind of talking in general about what is it about, like, you know, watching a show and starting a drama? Because, look, let's face it, like, investing in a drama is a big commitment. These are not short shows. Um, and so, you know, the first episode or the first couple of episodes usually have like an outsized bearing on like, if we're going to continue or not. Well, I think that's it then everyone. Thank you all for listening and let's say it. Thank you for listening to Afternoon Delight. Make sure to subscribe for more great K-Romance conversation. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Afternoon of Delight Podcast for more information on our podcast, behind-the-scenes photos, and, of course, pics of our favorite opas and unis. Annyeong! Annyeong!